We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. So said Aristotle two and a half thousand years ago. And we, of course, know the importance of good habits. And yet those bad habits just seem to creep up on us unawares and become a part of our lives. The slippery slope into the territory of bad habits is very well trodden, as you probably know. So much so that it is more like a very fast shoot as opposed to a path. But anyway, we can spend years building out our good habits. And yet when we stop concentrating for just a moment, we can find ourselves right back where we started. And so today I wanted to visit one of the best pieces of writing on the nature of our brain's attitude to hardship and how and why those lazy habits appear and take over our daily life. Hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast with me, Sam Webster-Harris. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you might remember that a few months ago we had Alistair Humphreys on the show, who's one of my all-time favorite authors and adventurers who's inspired a lot of my own journeys. And we spoke about his concept of the three stages of flabbiness, how they appear, and in his own polite British mannerisms, he spoke about it merely as just a self-reflection with his own issues, rather than to rudely point out his mean-sounding thoughts upon others. But sometimes we do all need some tough love, and trust me, his writing here is probably some of the medicine that you need to hear So this is a chapter from his book called There Are Other Rivers, and this chapter is called The Three Stages of Flabbiness. There are three stages of flabbiness in life. Each is more restricting and stifling than the one before. They creep insidiously over me, like vines, until it takes one hell of a struggle to escape their clutches. If I ever feel the saggy symptoms snuffling up on my life, then I know it is time to hit the road. The first stage of flabbiness, and the easiest to fix, is physical flabbiness. It begins when busy schedules, dark winter days, and perhaps eating too much, win the devil's foot race against the part of me that knows that exercise isn't a waste of time, but actually makes me more efficient, alert, and happy. Despite knowing this, I am still, at times, sufficiently idle to let my standards slip and my fitness slide away. Fitness is like chasing a shoal of fish difficult to master and get on top of, and easy to lose. If I don't go running for a few days, I feel cooped up and ratty. But if I leave it for a few more, the habit seems to be broken. I know I need to run, I want to run, but I just can't be bothered. Flabbiness has begun to set in, slowly, invasively, like cataracts. Before I know it, I'm easing out my belt buckle and blaming my sloth-like behavior on the effect of aging. The second stage of flabbiness is mental flabbiness. Give up exercising and stop forcing myself out the front door for a run and inevitably my mind starts to sag too. I used to feel alert and inquisitive. I read lots of books, but one evening I come home tired. Flopping down onto the sofa, I reach for the television remote instead. Suddenly I'm gripped by light entertainment. I realize how pleasant life can be if I stop thinking about it. It's much simpler to exist than to live. I've got a dishwasher and a coffee percolator, and I drink at home most nights with the TV on. I sit slumped in front of the telly, flicking around the channels until I have fritted away enough of my life and it's now time to go to bed. And finally, if I start forgetting any of these things, then I know I'm on the slippery slope towards the third and terminal stage of flabbiness, moral flabbiness. Each day, I am one day closer to my death, And no matter how aware I am of this, it's still sometimes difficult to believe in my own death. I don't know when I will die, so putting things off to an indeterminate date in an unguaranteed future is actually pretty daft. I do know that I am happiest when I have a sense of purpose. There are so many places I would like to see, so many interesting people to meet, so much to do, and there's so little time. Before I know it, I'll be dead, and what a bloody waste that will be if I've just been arsing around. And yet, by the time I have succumbed to the debilitating onslaught of physical and mental flabbiness, I'm already well on the primrose path to moral flabbiness. Not only have I conceded my physical health and settled for candy floss in place of my brain, I've accepted that that is actually good enough for my life. I've become comfortably numb. I've decided that friends repeats and a Chinese takeaway a sufficient return for the privilege of being born healthy and intelligent enough in one of the richest and most free countries on the planet 
I have a passport to explore the world. I will always be able to find some sort of work. I will never starve to death. It's hard really for me to come up with any decent excuses. The choices are just all mine. Life is too brief and too rich to tiptoe through half-heartedly, rather than galloping at it with whooping excitement and ambition. And so, I explode in rage, just in time. It's time to go prowling in the wilderness. It's time to live violently again. It's time to sort my life out. This can be done in two ways. I'll either jump in the nearest cold river for a bracing swim, or I'll plan a trip, set a start date, and come what may, begin. So... If you'd like to hear more or read more of Alistair Humphreys, then you can pick up a copy of his book, There Are Other Rivers, where this chapter came from. His other books on adventure are all very much worth a read, and he's a very brilliant author. But for now, we will carry on with the show, because as far as I'm concerned, we haven't yet finished with this concept at hand. So Alistair Humphreys is a very impressive human being who really hasn't spent a lot of time in the final stage of moral flabbiness. And as he said, this piece of writing was a self-reflection, and if you've seen the amount of adventures he's been on, he's clearly reached moral flabbiness a few times and immediately gone on an adventure and fixed his problems. Whereas most people don't necessarily have such a quick fix for this and have some further problems that get caused later on, which are the ones I want to go on to. So I would say the moral flabbiness that Alistair alludes to, which is just accepting that physical flabbiness and mental flabbiness is okay, is only just like part A, and there's a much more dangerous and second part to moral flabbiness that really affects many people. And this is to not only just feel okay with not taking ownership of your physical and mental faculties, but to start blaming other people and your environment or your upbringing for all your problems. Then we not only stop taking responsibility for our actions, but actively blame others for them. This episode is sponsored by NetSuite. When your business gets to a certain size, the cracks do just start to emerge. Things that you used to do in a day can take a week. If this is you, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, and 1. What's 36,000? Well, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle, the easiest place to streamline accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less. Close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And what is the number one for? Well, your business is one of a kind. So you can get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. And right now, for free, you can download NetSuite's KPI checklist just go to netsuite.com slash growth mindset. That's netsuite.com slash growth mindset. Growth is spelt G-R-O-W-T-H to get your own KPI checklist. There's a second part to moral flabbiness. And this is to not only stop taking responsibility for our actions, but actively blame others for them. This means that instead of seeing ourselves as the source of power to change our situation, we leave ourselves helpless to everyone and everything around us. And blaming is very, very easy. We might blame our job, our partner, our parents, our upbringing, the weather, social media, the supermarket, society, capitalism, politics, who knows what else for whatever problem it might be that you have. And yes, there are many things going on in the world or in your history that might make your situation more difficult. The only person that can fix your problems is yourself. And so if you're blaming others, you will lose responsibility and you'll remain fixed within your problems. And that is fixed mindset thinking and not growth mindset thinking. This is where you stop improving and you actually hunker down into just a life of problems and depression. And you may have noticed that as people get into like studying psychology and hearing about it, this often goes with a growing desire to just blame their upbringing or their parents for everything. And yet, Outsourcing responsibility is just signing up for a lifetime of flabbiness and problems. There's a quote which says, You are not responsible for the programming you picked up in childhood. However, as an adult, you are 100% responsible for changing it. And I'm not saying that I don't have any sympathy for people's problems. And I certainly wouldn't pretend that their life isn't difficult. After all, Aristotle did say that good habits formed at youth will make all the difference. But ultimately, this is your life, so you need to take control. 
And for me, I for sure acknowledge that when I was young, I was really lucky to uh, live near mountains in Wales where I would go mountain biking and kayaking and running every week. And exercise was like a part of my upbringing. But if you want to be healthy, it's too late to change your upbringing. And the only person who can change your habits now is you. When my partner grew up, she didn't really exercise that much. And the first time that she tried my bike, she cried. A week later, we went for a bike ride over 20 minutes and she kind of got a bit exhausted and overwhelmed by the feeling of her body feeling exhausted and she started crying again. And I've certainly realized that there's a difference between people who did a lot of exercise when they were young and you get kind of used to the feeling of exhaustion and like seek it more. Whereas if you haven't grown up with exercise, for example, the idea that your body feels worn out or bad is not something that you would expect is a good thing and it takes a while to kind of rewire your brain but for my partner she just took it slowly and did like shorter rides for a while and now she does bike to work most days we live in Amsterdam and it's very easy to do that and yes it was a process of six months but there's nothing saying that because she didn't exercise when she was young that she can't now start exercising and this was just one example but there are many different ways to approach fixing your flabby habits and your flabby thinking and working out why they happen and what you can do about them. And of course, I'm personally a huge fan of Alistair's approach of just jumping into a freezing body of cold water and shocking your system, or for just signing up for a really big adventure where you put yourself out of your comfort zone and escape your day-to-day -day routines and teach yourself that you can do hard things. But there are other options such as therapy, meditation, journaling, taking psychedelics under controlled settings has really shown to help people a lot or simply finding a way of making healthy habits more enjoyable, where you spend time having fun with people that you like, doing something that benefits you. One thing to look into is certainly reducing your screen time and questioning if you really need so much social media or Netflix in your life. I think it's really cool to try and schedule one or two nights a week where you just deliberately don't let yourself take the lazy option of watching TV and instead try and find a way to play a game or read a book or do some painting or writing or music because it's so enjoyable to use the creative and social muscles that you have and practice them. And if you do feel awkward about abandoning your social media, I would really, really advise anyone to just have a detox to show yourself that you don't need it every day in your life. Obviously, different things work for different people, but do take some time to write out some ideas of how you can make some healthier habits for you more fun. If you want to cook more of your own healthy food, then pencil in some dates to have some friends over for dinner and spend some time researching recipes that you think you'd enjoy. Or try signing up to a challenge with a friend. This month, my partner and I wanted to do more art and writing, so we've committed to a whole month of doing just a 30-minute co-working session each day where she's going to do some drawing or painting, and I'm going to write. It just adds a little bit of like motivation to sort of start doing those, those habits that you want to do. So whatever it is, find a way to increase some accountability and increase the amount of fun it might be and try to make it easy. As the master BJ Fogg said in his book, if you pick the right small behavior and sequence it correctly, then you won't have to motivate yourself to make it grow. It'll just happen naturally, just like a good seed planted in a good spot. And on that, we have discussed the stages of flabbiness and how it's so easy to stop taking responsibility for our physical health and then realize that we stop really using our brains. And finally, we'll accept our situation and our attitudes and start blaming others for all our problems and stop taking responsibility. Now, growth mindset is all about tapping into the power that you have within yourself to control your own destiny and your own behaviors and to take ownership of building the life that you want to live. So thank you so much for listening. If you're on Spotify, I'd love to hear any of your favorite parts of the episode that hit you in the comments. And if you're feeling generous, do leave me a good rating there or on Apple or anywhere else. Please have yourselves an awesome week. And remember, if you want to enjoy your life, that starts with enjoying today because life is to be enjoyed. Because life is to be enjoyed and that's not something that you should put off for the future. So be kind to yourself and whilst you're at it, be kind to someone else too.